Next speaker is Tony David. Uh, I think a lot of you already know Tony. He's the director of the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environmental Division, and he's also a U.S. member of the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board. For nearly 20 years, Tony has expanded the role of the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, where he's an enrolled tribal member, to assess and restore aquatic resources. In 2016, he led the decommission and removal of the Hogansburg Hydroelectric Project. St. Regis Mohawk Tribe is the first tribal nation to remove a licensed dam in the U.S. Its removal restored over 500 miles of tributary habitat with the St. Lawrence River and cleared policy obstacles for other tribes to take similar action. In 2017, he received the Environmental Champion Award, the highest award granted to civilians by the US EPA. In 2019, Mr. David became the director of the Environment Division which includes multiple programs in natural resources, solid waste, and agriculture. His current priorities include infrastructure improvements, climate resilience, and adaptive management. Since January of 2017, Tony has served as a member of the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board. The board mandate is to ensure that the regulation of outflows from Lake Ontario remain consistent with the directive from the International Joint Commission. He received a Master of Professional Studies from the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University and a BA from SUNY Buffalo in Environmental Studies. Just uh, before I let Tony up here, I'll tell you, I think we are very fortunate in the Thousand Islands area to have two senior members of the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board living and working here on our shores. And uh, I have Tony's cell phone number. <laughs> he does respond. But uh, some of those questions that people throw at me on Saturday night or Sunday morning, you have the person to ask those questions to here in Tony. So Tony. Thanks for that introduction, John. Um, and it's an, an absolute honor to be here. Um, before uh, coming today, I viewed some of the previous uh, presentations over the years and just some uh, esteemed colleagues and experts in the fields of, of water resources. Um, and, you know, so it really is an honor to be here. So it's, uh, you know, just to be a little, to not to draw any confusion, you know, I. Uh, I wear multiple hats, um, so today I'm here, uh, I'm always going to be who I am, right? I'm the d director of the, my tribe's environment division, but I'm also a member on the board that regulates outflows, and so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to separate the two, you know, but I, I am who I am. Um, but first of all, I just want to acknowledge and thank all of you for taking some time and out of your, giving up your Saturday to come here and devote some uh, um, effort to some thinking and even expose different ideas. So just want to congratulate you all. If you're here, you are definitely critical thinkers. Um, you're interested in our resources and you care about our resources. Um, so congratulations. And um, with that, um, I'd just like to jump in first a little bit about me. Um, so have to acknowledge my ancestors. Uh, I am a descendant of multiple survivors of residential schools. Um, my great-grandparents were taken from their families uh, to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to the Carlisle Indian School. Um, and they, they survived, but they were taught that their language was dirty. They thought they were taught that their cultures and traditions were savage. Um, and yet, they survived, and, and we survived, and our language survives, and our culture survives. So. I must firsthand uh, acknowledge that. Um, I guess you could call me uh, an outdoorsman. I enjoy living in what I consider one of the best places in the world. Um, where we live in Akwesasne is about uh, 
the Mohawk territory of Akwesasne is just about 100 miles downstream from here, but we have quick access to the Adirondacks, the St. Lawrence River. Um, if you want to go to the city, you could go up to Montreal. Or, you know, we're just like in just such a great location. But, um, and I'm sure all of you feel the same way. And one of, I've been working for my, my tribe for about 19 years. And one of my first professional assignments was uh, we were actually involved with a lawsuit against the St. Lawrence Seaway. And we were suing them over the harmful impacts of ice breaking. And we were concerned that they were violating the conditions of their environmental assessment. And long story short, uh, I ended up on boarding the Martha Black Canadian Coast Guard vessel on, and observing their icebreaking mission in the St. Lawrence River. And then, actually, they, they loaded my little pickup truck onto the deck of the Martha L. Black. And I had a one-way ticket from uh, Baharnwa to uh, Snellock in Messina. So that was very interesting. But I got to see firsthand and uh, that mission, but also what the river looks like when it's uh, uh, encapsulated with ice. Um, in 2016, we removed the dam. Um, restoring, returning the land back to tribal ownership that had been taken from us for over 200 years, restoring the environment, taking a leadership role in that. You know, but also, um, it, 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 it really um, s signaled to me the importance of having a seat at the table and being a decision maker. Um, so after removing a dam, likely the, the only likely step after the, removing a dam was to be named to the board of uh, a major international hydro dam that controls the outflows from Lake Ontario. Um, so with that, um, just a little bit of the things that I want to cover today. Um, it's, it's my duty to talk about water regulation and give an overview of that just so we're all on the same page. But really, um, my area of interest is in topics of communication. And I love to communicate. I love connecting people, um, discussing ideas, engaging, you know, and it's getting really, really tough to do that lately. Um, and I want to talk about that, you know, because we really, we need to be able to sit in a room like this and talk about those issues, understand, and move towards uh, a commitment, right? And um, so we want to go over some of those issues, some of my observations, and um, it, I, it's not my intent to to, sh to shame anybody, I'm not going to name any names or anything like that, but you know, we, we need to be frank and we need to be able to talk. Um, and then last, we want to talk about dis defining resilience. What does that mean? Nobody really wants to volunteer and, and define resilience, you know, um, but we need to have that conversation. So just a little bit of uh, geographic orientation. Um, in, this pic in this map, we see the upper Great Lakes in orange. So I think most of us know the upper Great Lakes drain over through Lake Erie and then eventually into Lake Ontario. The Lake Ontario Basin is in blue and the St. Lawrence River Basin is in green. And then we also included the Ottawa River Basin which joins the St. Lawrence near Montreal. And just for context, the Ottawa River Basin is larger than the landmass of the state of New York. And it drains through one river system. And the flows through the Ottawa uh, often impact the capacity of the St. Lawrence River. So it's just important to recognize that. Um, the Boundary Waters Treaty. So basically, the United States and Canada gave up um, the rights to bilateral uh, diversions of water along their common frontier, along their common border. And in the Boundary Waters Treaty, they also created the International Joint Commission. And the IJC really has two primary roles, to approve or deny diversions of water, and also to write reports. And they're really good at writing reports. Um, some of you may recall the Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River study. Um, so they are tasked with um, studying a lot of the important issues that are affecting the boundary waters. Um, a lot of the issues, te highly technical issues affecting the Great Lakes. Um, and also to issue orders of approval. So once they coordinate the agreement from the United States and Canada, um, the orders of approval put those into action. And under the IJC, there are several boards. So I'm a member of the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board. There are three US members of the US section, three members in the Canadian section, and we are supported by various committees. Um, we also are uh, supported by advisory groups, including operations advisory groups. Um, and then we're supported by the regulation representatives who are the, the engineers that are doing the weekly tabulation for 
um, plan out, uh, outflow from, from Lake Ontario. But this thing, plan 2014, um, means a lot of different things to different people. Um, to some, uh, one of my colleagues who is an engineer, um, plan 2014 is a computer program. It might seem kind of odd, but really, it's an algorithm of complex rules about calculating the outflow. And how that works is, it looks at, starts with the level on Lake Ontario, looking at that level, calculates an outflow, also makes adjustments based on future weather conditions. Um, but then the next step is it takes that calculated outflow and then it checks it against limiting factors, limiting conditions within the St. Lawrence River. So at any given time, the plan may be calling for a high outflow, for example, but it can't do that, it can't achieve that because of the limiting conditions within the river. And I think I also have to tip my hat to this idea about deviations, right? So under certain situations, extreme conditions, um, the board will have automatic authority to deviate from plan flow. So prior to the construction of this system uh, from 1955 through 1960, the outflow from Lake Ontario was a fixed stage discharge relationship. So when the level of the lake was high, the outflow through the river was high. And conversely, when the level was low, the outflow was low. So we really had, we had no influence over that whatsoever. But through the construction of this major international works, it took over five years, um, the dredging of over 210 million cubic yards of material. Now, what they really did was they targeted some of the natural and existing um, bedrock dams that, that were on the St. Lawrence River, and they blasted holes through them, so represented by the shaded areas on this slide. So, and that's not a coincidence, right? The notch, the notch that was carved in those dams was a very specific size based on ships of a, of a certain size and the future hydropower capacity given supplies of the past from 1900 to, uh, to 1960. Right? So it was very specific uh, design criteria. And downstream from there, oh, I'm sorry, can we go back one, please? So this location here, this is just downstream. This is near Red Mills, New York, um, Galoo Island, I believe it's called. Um, so on the right-hand side, you'll see the location of the Iroquois Dam and also the Iroquois Lock. Um, so this seems to be a, a, a point of confusion for some folks um, who, who think that this is where regulation occurs. It doesn't. Um, the purpose of the Iroquois Dam, just downstream from here, is to actually help uh, lower levels on the Four Bay uh, Lake St. Lawrence. So we'll get to that one next. But, um, the reason, why, I guess the reason for that confusion is that this is the point where the river starts its steep downhill slope towards the Atlantic Ocean, right? So when we see changes of outflow, they see the drop off of levels here. Maybe that, that's, that's uh, maybe a source of confusion for that, but um, just a, a massive amount of work to permanently alter uh, the flow capacity of the St. Lawrence River. So the four bay, so this is near between Messina and Cornwall. Um, and Akwesasne. Um, so you see the locations of the Moses Saunders Dam and the Longsu Dam, um, but also the two locks that were constructed by the United States, so the Eisenhower and Snell locks. Uh, in addition to that, I have to acknowledge the uh, traditional, uh, the aboriginal lands of the Mohawks of Akwesasne. Uh, these were lands that were reserved to us uh, by treaty that was ratified by the United States Congress. Um, so, you know, I have no qualms with saying that the Moses Saunders Dam is built on Mohawk land and its impact um, in both bringing commercial navigation and industrial manufacturing has permanently altered the lifestyles of Mohawk people. Um, and of course, I, I have to acknowledge our neighbors as well. Um, just upstream from here, um, six towns and thousands of residents were, were forcibly relocated for the construction of this works. Now, if we expand upon that idea, that pre-project discharge, um, we now have a situation where we can adjust flows higher under wet, certain wet conditions, and we can adjust flows down during drier conditions. And so that describes the overall the capacity, but you notice that the highest flows are only possible when the lake is high, and lower flows are only possible when, the lowest flows are possible when the lake is level is low. Now, I mentioned a little bit about the design criteria, but that has a little bit more to do with the Boundary Waters Treaty 
between the United States and Canada. And there are the three users that are specifically referenced within the Boundary Waters Treaty, and those are municipal water supply, sanitary water supply, uh, commercial navigation, and hydropower development. So those are the, the, what the primary design criteria were for. And the other groups are considered interests. So, so there you see uh, riparian communities, and then they separate upstream and, upstream and downstream riparian communities to mean like the province of Quebec versus Lake Ontario, Upper St. Lawrence River. Um, but also recreational boating is considered an interest. And new to Plan 2014 is this idea of the environment also being an interest. So not necessarily guaranteed outcomes as a result of the design, but it is included um, within the order of approval. And the funding, you know, people often say, you know, follow the money, follow the money. Follow, you know, and I, I agree. Yes, let's, let's follow the money. The investment for this system came from two primary sources. $650 million split between the utilities of New York and Ontario to construct the hydro dam. And they were responsible for financing that through rate user fees, but also the dredging that was required for enhancement of hydropower capacity was paid for by the hydro en entities compared to the dredging that was required for shipping. That was paid by the shipping interest. And the shipping interest combined investment was uh, $460 million. Now, the ca Canadians are a bit ha more heavily invested in this than the United States. They have, out of the seven locks, they constructed five, operate five, we operate two. Um, but clearly, you know, they had a much more uh, vested interest in commercial navigation in the United States. However, both are considered uh, vital interests of the American people and the Canadian people, but they're also obligations to each other. So the United States is obligated to ensure safe naviga navigation with Canada and Canada with the United States. Um, a little bit about uh, outflow capacity. So some of you may be familiar with the term of the navigation limit or the L limit. And so this slide just depicts how that capacity changes with the level of Lake Ontario. So when the levels are lowest, the uh, navigation limit is at its lowest rate. And then as levels increase, that level, uh, that the navigation limit also increases. We have p depicted here as well the um, pre-project discharge in yellow. Um, but the blue dotted line you see on top were the actual outflows that were achieved in 2019 um, during the last high water event. So we were able to work with the the board members were able to work and agree to um, a deviation strategy that would actually go and have outflows above the navigation um, limit. So the design envelope of the, of the navigation channel, we were actually for several weeks exceeding that design envelope. So it's a very risky situation. Um, the seaways are extremely risk adverse. It's um, in everyone's best interest that that is a safely monitored and administered system. Um, so that required a whole lot of mitigation, a whole lot of things that happened behind the scenes that we, most of us don't even have any uh, knowledge of. But overall, the system works best at um, reducing the impacts of flooding. It can't eliminate them, okay? Um, but it's best at, at speeding the recovery following a high water event. So on this, on this chart, we'll see the, um, the pre-project levels. So had the Moses Saunders Dam never been constructed, no seaway, um, we would have seen higher levels in 2017. And the interesting part of this story, which doesn't get talked about very much, is that without this system, the surplus of water on Lake Ontario in 2017 would have actually carried over into the following year, right? So, um, and the, the surplus of water in 2019 would have carried over into that following year. So in fact, we would have had five years of flooding in six consecutive years, you know, it weren't, if the system weren't constructed. So the best measure of the system is not necessarily in preventing flooding, but it is in that distance that we can achieve where the actual observed levels versus what we would have seen without the construction. So um, those are in yellow and black on this graph. So you see um, that in 2017, the levels were lower than uh, pre-project. Um, and then the blue dashed line is, this thing, is, is the long-term average. And so just as a point of reference. 
So, this is where we switch gears, okay? Um, whether or not, we, some of you may or may not realize, but there tends to be a bit of controversy surrounding <laughs> this topic, and that's okay. We, we need to talk about that. Uh, we need to be able to reach out, and we need to be able to share information, because ultimately, um, if we're going to solve the issues tied to water levels and flows, we need to work together. You know, and I, I strongly believe that the solutions are there. We can find them. We just have to be willing to work together. And it's going to be hard. So what I would like to do in this next stage of the, of the talk is explore some of those ideas, some of those barriers, right? Um, you know, I may stake my career on barrier removals, okay? Um, so I'll just jump right in. And again, it's not my intention to shame anybody. I'm not going to name any names or anything like that. But we just need to be aware so that when you encounter these barriers, you can identify them and then work on ways to get around them. So this is where I channel the en energy of our celebrity physicist and influencer podcaster, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who talks about, um, who is a master in science communication, talks about three truths, right? So there are personal truths. So there are things that we hold dear that are true to us because we need them to be true. Right? Then there are political truths, which could have gotten a little awkward, but no. <laughs> but, I, you know, sometimes our elected officials say things to get votes. <laughs> sometimes we say things that are attended to special interests, right? And in the moment when they're saying these things, they're true because they're effective. They work, right? They work. Um, but we need to be able to identify those. And uh, Dr. Tyson's idea, his position, is that the best, best truths are objective truths, right? Because if you collect some information, do an analysis, draw some conclusions, and then give your results to one of your critics, and they verify, they come to the same conclusion, well, then that's something that you have in common. That's something that you can share, right? You have um, a shared understanding, an objective understanding. And I think that's ultimately what we all wish to aspire towards. So some of these barriers, and we talk about narratives, right, stories, and we love stories. I mean, what's a story without a good hero and a, and a, and a victim and a villain, right? You know, those are the best stories. We are, we are actually, our neurobiology within our brains, we are evolved to look for stories and assign stories, okay? Um, labels. Um, the problem with labels, the classifying, you know, it may save time, it may be quick, but a lot of times they're restrictive or they can even be in inaccurate. So we are at the Winter Environmental Conference of Save the River. Apparently, I mean, all of you are radical environmentalists, right? <laughs> We've heard this time before, you know. And you, ma'am, I, I, you, you're probably the most radical of them all. <laughs> She's like, yeah, I'm pretty rad. <laughs> but these labels don't do us any good, right? It doesn't allow for an accurate understanding of, uh, of, of, the, of, of the topics. Um, and then there's this concept of normal. We talk about normal. Oh, this is not normal. What's normal? What's abnormal? If we're, talk, if we're concerned about water levels and flows, what, 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 what difference does it make if it's normal or abnormal? I mean, if it's happening, it's happening. We need to be prepared, right? Does that, does that even matter? We're so fixated on this idea of normal. Bias, personal bias, professional bias, um, all sorts of bias exists, you know, but we look to find ways to collect information and produce um, uh, information that removes bias as much as we can. Um, and blame. Blame is, a, blame is a tactic, right? It's classic. Because if someone else is at fault, if it's someone else's problem, then I don't have to examine how I contribute. I don't have to examine how my decisions impact, right? Um, we've, in my time with the board, we've, I've seen all of these play out many, many times. You know, and, and you know, it's, the, it's human nature. We love stories. We love good stories. I mean, the, the Howell uh, story slam is, you know, great. Just grab something from the local media. Um, you know, we love stories, so, but we have to be aware of them. 
here's a story. A um, little bit of a hint. This is from the Great Lakes Adaptive Management Committee. This is one of a picture taken from one of their reports. Um, this is the flooding vent. Does anybody know where this is? Any guesses? This is in Quebec. This is in Quebec. So I think one of the stories that we have all heard is that the Plan 2014 is all about saving Montreal. It's all about saving Montreal. Well, this is actually just downstream of Montreal. And um, if this is flood protection, I don't think it's very good. Um, you know, so this, the, when you dig deeper into the narrative and you unpack the stories and you look for facts, you look to verify information, you know, what's not being discussed? Well, in the province of Quebec, during the high water events, over 6,000 people were displaced from their homes. Over 3,000 homes were flooded and affected by mandatory evacuations. And of those homes, a thousand, nearly a thousand, were slated for um, uh, uh, constru uh, demolition. Right? They were damaged so severely that they were not going to be rebuilt. You know, that does not really sound like flood protection to me. And this is taking in May of 2019. Right? So this is a time where um, some people were calling for increasing outflows, right? And, um, you know, so having this information and understanding the limits and the capabilities of regulation is so crucial. And this is a picture I, I got from social, ne social media, used with permission, um, just this past winter. Um, Oswego Lighthouse, um, 60 mile an hour winds, roaring over Lake Ontario. Is this normal? Is this abnormal? Does it matter? Does it matter? I mean, it happened. We have to think in terms of what is, what is happening out there, what we've observed, and learn from that. 18-foot um, waves on Lake Ontario. <laughs> I can't imagine. For some reason, we do not think of the, lake, uh, the Great Lakes as freshwater oceans. I think we should. I really think we should. Because when it comes to the ocean up and down the eastern seaboard, we think of, we think of uh, infrastructure and, and residential development as being prepared for a much broader range. And we accept that, right? For whatever reason, we don't accept that on the Great Lakes. I think we should. So again, you know, really driving home this idea, examination of the term normal. So these are water levels on Lake Ontario depicted by the blue line. Um, you know, generally what we see is the lowest levels occurring in winter and then a, a seasonal rise with a peak happening in May, um, sometimes in June, and then the seasonal decline heading back into winter. So for some, this, de 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 um, so this determines um, normal, but it doesn't exist, right? It, it doesn't exist. It's just, this is just a statistic. Um, it's a summary of data, but it doesn't re it's not real, it doesn't exist. So if we want to talk about what is real, this is the full range of observed levels and flows. This is a completely different picture, completely different. Um, you know, and I, it's really, it's my suggestion that the, the overuse of the term normal um, is to our own detriment, to be honest with you. Normal is a range of flows. Um, normal is a range of levels. And to be perfectly honest with you, we are not even consistently prepared for levels that we've observed. And I don't know if you've heard, but there's this thing called climate change going on. It might get worse. We expect it to get worse. And it's not just going to be one type of change. It could be a change in both directions of being wetter and being drier. Are we ready for that? Um, there is this thing called the Great Lakes Adaptive Management Community. I've used some of their information in, these, in this slide, so I definitely want to give a plug for that. Um, the, uh, the IJC has devoted a lot of resources and a lot of ex experts towards um, studying a lot of the, uh, the elements of Plan 2014. Um, they're calling it an expedited review. Um, so they're looking at all sorts of things between uh, examination of uh, commercial navigation, shoreline impacts associated with high water, uh, recreational boating. You may see surveys about recreational boating coming from the IJC, um, and a whole number of issues. Uh, in, in the environment, I'll call, there's a whole group devoted to um, studying the ecology and uh, development of these things called performance indicators. And um, so their work, they've, 
they've created a public advisory group made up of representatives from around the basin, um, collected a lot of information, and one of the things that they developed is this uh, very useful uh, thing called a dis decision support tool. So during certain, during high water events, it actually gives us some really good updated information on coastal zone impacts at these locations. So these are some of the black dots on this map are some of the areas where they've collected a lot of that, that data. And just to give you an example of like what some of this information looks like, uh, delineation of these coastal zones, um, looking at the, up, the newest available information like LIDAR and stuff like that, um, and looking at where the thresholds are for different types of impacts from uh, moderate, major, severe, and extreme. And it's, it's, fa it's absolutely fascinating. Every, every location has different priorities, but also has, having different vulnerabilities. And each location, I should say each jurisdiction, deals with those risks in different ways. Some jurisdictions deal with this head on, some deal with it sort of indirectly, um, and others don't really seem to get involved at all. Um, and not, not to pick on the, the town of Greece, they're actually one of the better um, U.S. jurisdictions in terms of coastal resilience. They're very proactive, very forward-thinking. They still have, but they still have a lot of vulnerability. And um, just think about this. If we go back to the previous slide with the full range of levels of flows and, and think about the frequency which, which, with which they experience both moderate and major impacts, you know, I think we need to have a conversation about setting goals and improving those scores. I don't, you know, this is more, I see this more as like a resilience scorecard, you know. Um, we don't have a location, a, a, a zone for Clayton, but we do have for, for Gananoque, which is just across the river, right? So similar. So uh, if anyone is interested, check out the GLAM report, um, and you can look at the, uh, uh, the location for Gananoque. But um, resilience and adaptive management, you know, and there's been uh, other presenters who have come to this very conference and talked about that, so I don't want to spend too much time, but it's basically just looking to collect information, revise plans, test it, and where performance doesn't meet expectations, revise the plan again and re-implement. But oftentimes, um, you know, and the previous presenter made the point that oftentimes it's re re recover, rebuild, forget, right? That's, that's kind of the, what happens. So, you know, um, that, that, that was Bill Warrick, and he's an, an advisor to the IJC, and he, he often, often talks about how there is, following a natural disaster, there is a, a window of opportunity where there is enough attention and outrage that people care about these issues and are willing to devote time and effort to addressing them. But over time, that window closes, right? And um, there's a lot of case history on this. And if anyone is interested, I strongly recommend um, checking out the book by the journalist Gilbert Gall called Geography of Risk. It is all about that. And um, it is a whole mechanism, and a whole, it's, I wouldn't call it an industry, but it is a way of take, the concept is we're taking the risk of coastal develop, development and we're socializing it, right? We're making the taxpayer come in and pay for those things, pay for the recovery. And he talked, he, he interviewed one, one uh, um, elected official and he said that, you know, following an emergency, there are no Republicans and Democrats, right? Everybody wants that recovery money. Everybody's fighting to get that recovery money. So it, it is something that costs all of us. It costs all of us. So um, we need to keep eyes on that. Um, but, yeah. and, you know, I think this is important to mention that what we're observing on, this is just supplies, so net total supplies, which is um, the water from Lake Erie plus precipitation minus evaporation. So the total water budget for Lake Ontario, we're seeing a shift. And the design of the system started off looking at 1900 to 1960. But since that time, we've seen a shift up. More supplies, more water coming into the system. That's beyond the design of the original design pr uh, parameters of, of the system. So what does that mean? You know, to me, it means that we are going to have more times where stakeholders have an expectation that we're not observing out there in the, in the real world. So how do we have that conversation about des describing that gap? 
how do we close that gap, right? And ultimately, I think the ultimate goal here is about mutual understanding, right? We, have, we all have common goals. We have common goals about improving the ecology of the Great Lakes. We have common goals about improving coastal resilience. We have common goals for um, preventing damages, all sorts of damages. Um, but how we get there requires us to get together, roll up our sleeves, and, and have that conversation. And this is, a, I borrowed this from a, a, another presenter, um, this idea of change management, right? And starting off with denial, and denying that there's a problem, someone else's problem, resistance to eventually exploring ideas, looking at different alternatives, to ultimately a commitment, right? So a lot of times we get stuck in denial and resistance, so we need to get unstuck. Um, and so this is my last slide. Um, just want to uh, provide a little bit of a forecast indicator for what we should expect for 2023. So this uh, is depicting the water levels and where we are right now in 2023. And this shaded area represents the cone of the, the probabilistic forecast, both wet and, and dry. So um, it's a 90%, so it's not all, it's not all inclusive, but it's a 90% probability will be within that. But the more than half of that range is below the long-term average. So if things continue to moderate like how they are, Lake Erie's coming down, um, if we have average um, precipitation within the basin, we can expect at or just below um, average levels on, on Lake Ontario. And so that has you know, implications for um, us in the river as well. Um, but you know, with that said, you know, anything could happen at this point, right? I mean, we could be hit with another extreme event. Uh, it doesn't look like you know, winter is gonna be too much of a problem. It's actually, it's a little bit troubling to me and my drive in to this uh, location. There's really not much river ice out there. Um, you know, so that's, that's, that's a solid indicator of, of what we, at least where we expect to go from here. Um, and I've also talked with uh, um, uh, the regulation representatives yesterday, just getting a sense for, you know, a lot of times we have um, discussions about Plan 2014 and this concept of induced variability. We're trying to use the influence of the system to um, either um, raise levels up or push levels down. Um, and the result of that yesterday was, was that, you know, we're coming off of historic supplies. I mean, the last five or six years, we've never seen this much water come into the system. So coming off of that, the plan is recognizing that, the declining supplies, so it will not likely push as hard as it did in 2022. Um, but, you know, even still, we still are, would, it, I think it'd be reasonable to expect a slightly below um, average levels in, in 2023. So I think that's, Questions. So um, this, this is a picture of the Longsu Dam. Um, I think it's a little bit more uh, picturesque, you know, to, to take a picture of that than the Moses Saunders Dam because you really don't see any flowing water, really. But this is uh, so the balance. The Plan 2014 calculates the outflow, and then the whatever can't flow through Moses Saunders Dam, the balance of that flow goes through the Longsu Dam. So we've actually been, as a good indicator, we've been using this more every year. Uh, than ever before in the history of the system because of um, the demand for high outflows. So, thank you. wants to go first? The Geography of Risk, Gilbert Gall. Sir, in the back. Three or four slides back, you see the next um, slide chart. There was a dramatic shift, which there was a, I couldn't see the dates on the bottom, but there was a low water event, and then that after the period of time, it shifted up. What, what were those dates? Just curiosity. Is it, it seems that, as you, I think you 
Yeah. Yeah, that one right there. So from 1970, from 1970 on. So really the start of the first high water events within the system. So 73, 74, 76 were the first high water events. Um, and really interesting, actually I, I should plug this as well. Um, if you folks are really interested in water regulation, I implore you to, to locate the U.S. Senate hearing testimony uh, in 1976, talked about the high water events and the Great Lakes water problems, right? Um, if you change the dates and re replace Plan 1958DD with Plan 2014, the script has not changed. Check that out. The responsibility for coastal resilience is with all of us in this room, you know, um, but the jurisdiction resides with state and local jurisdictions. Right? They are the decision makers. They're the planners, right? So the IJC has no role, zero role in coastal resilience. And in fact, I think that's a good thing, right? Because honestly, these are sovereign decisions for the state of New York and the people of the state of New York to decide, right? Where to build, what to build, how to build. Um, could you imagine if the IGC came in and, and tried to answer those questions for us? There'd be people would be in the streets, right? So it is, it is 100%. Uh, depends on us. It depends on our elected officials um, to make those decisions and to prepare for the future. Good question. Thank you. Okay, so good question, good question. So, um, and, you know, I think that a lot of that is location specific, you know, so you may want to start with your local planning office. Um, but as far as information about water regulation, you can go right to the board's website. And there are learning modules about different, um, the different aspects of uh, water regulation. So right now we're talking about the possibility of limiting outflows because of ice formation. Um, there's a whole video on, on the eye limit, and it's really interesting about that interplay between how we reduce outflows to encourage the growth of ice to prevent ice jams. Um, if you're thinking about uh, flooding concerns during the summer and you hear about the flood limit, there's a learning module on, on that. So there's really good um, information about what we do, uh, but there's also excellent um, information, up-to-date information at the, for the local level. And think about um, um, New York Sea Grant and Cornell University. Um, they have developed some parcel-specific parcel flood elevation uh, modeling, looking at, you can zoom in onto a particular location and look at different flood risk scenarios, very useful tools. And um, so that, you know, I, I would encourage you all to, to check that out. So there's a lot of really good information, uh, but I would start with the board's website. One photograph you had of the flooding in Quebec in 2019, because I think we all remember 2019 here. A lot of us were deciding how high our boots were going to be to get off our docks, to get onto our islands. So we had flooding too, but there was this myth going around that those people down in Montreal and those people in Quebec were not suffering from the flooding. And that just is not the case. This is a huge and complex system out there. Uh, and we all share the challenges with it. So not really a question. No, just kind no, of no, no thanks. Well, maybe the last, uh, there's no other questions, I guess. You know, just, this is just a, a primer, just an introduction to the idea about being able to identify those barriers and pick them apart, ask critical questions. So, you know, hopefully it's been, been useful to all of you. And uh, just thank you for the, the opportunity to present.